Good morning. Can you hear me? Okay. Welcome to the board meeting of the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technician. This meeting is being held Friday, February 21st, 2020 at the Los Angeles Marriott Burbank Airport, 2500 North Hollywood Way, Burbank, California, 91505. I would like to call this meeting to order. Um, I would like to thank the schools and all other members of public who have joined us today. For the sake of time, I will not be introducing those schools who have signed in, but we appreciate your presence. Um, I want to thank the board members. We actually got out at a decent time last night. <laughs> thank you for the hard work so that we um, finished in a timely manner. So I'm going to introduce myself. I'm the current board president, Tammy Endozo. If I could have the board members introduce themselves, starting at my far left. Good morning, Donna Norton, LVN member. Uh, good morning, Paul Sellers, psychiatric technician member. Good morning, John Deerking, public member. Good morning, I'm Bernice Bastin Martinez, uh, current vice president of the board and public member. Kenneth Maxey, public member. Alija Carpenter, public member. Dr. Carol Mountain, education member. Good morning, Melissa Rubicava, psychiatric technician member. And we have one more board member who's supposed to join us. She's probably stuck in traffic, so, but we'll go ahead and get started because we have a quorum of the board. If I could ask everyone to stand and please join us in the pledge as led by my fellow board member, military veteran, Paul Sellers. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. If I could have the executive officer please introduce herself and the staff present. Thank you, Madam Chair. Elaine Yamaguchi, the executive officer. With me is um, BVNPT staff, Jay Prouty, Vicki Saavedra, Helen Park, our NECs, our senior uh, supervising NEC, Marie Cordero, Cindy Fairchild, Jessica Gomez, and Margarita Valdez. Thank you. If I could have... Um, Legal counsel introduce himself. Thank you, Madam Chair. Kenneth L. Swenson, Attorney 3, Senior Staff Counsel, General Counsel for the Board. We, we also have Clay Jackson, Attorney 3, Senior Staff Counsel, who is our Regulations Attorney. Present. Thank you. At this time, I guess I'm going to take executive privilege. Um, on the agenda, I want to move agenda item 13 and 14 after the agenda item 15 with the educational committee or division and committee report. So. The Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technician is required to hold public meetings and make policy decisions that protect the health, safety, and welfare of California consumers. Public meeting agendas are prepared well in advance of the board meeting. Agenda requests for consideration must be clearly set forth in writing. The board requests that all, all items and supporting documents be included on the agenda and be received in the Sacramento headquarters by the first day of the month preceding the month of the scheduled board meeting. In addition, if there are documents that you would like board members to timely review and consider relative to an agenda item, the board asks that you submit 15 copies of the document and provide the board an electronic version of the document. Please ensure that you redact any students' names prior to copying information. During the meeting today, public comment is welcome on any agenda item when the item is taken up by the board. Under the bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, the board may not take any action on issues raised by public comment that are not on the agenda, other than to decide whether to schedule that issue for a future meeting. 
If any person wishes to address the board, please come forward to the podium when I call for public comment. It is helpful for the record if you would state your name and the name of the organization you represent. However, you may remain anonymous if you wish to do so. Please conduct yourself in a professional manner while making comments. I must insist that all those who wish to comment direct their comments to the board members and refrain from personal attacks. We have a full agenda today. In order to allow board members sufficient time to conduct its scheduled business, I may limit the time given to each person who wishes to comment, generally three minutes. Please understand this is because we want to hear from everyone and give all those who wish to do so a chance to comment. We would rather hear from everyone for three minutes instead of one person for 30 minutes. If we could have your comments focused and relevant to the applica applicable agenda item and directed to the board. If you wish, you, it's acceptable for you to state that you agree with the previous speaker or may make an original statement. If I forget to ask for public comment on an agenda item, it's not because I intend to limit comment. So raise your hand and come to the podium and I will recognize you. The board appreciates your cooperation and assistance in meeting its legal mandate. Okay, let's get started. We are on. Eleven. Eleven. Oh. Eleven. What did I do with that? Board meeting minutes. Oh no, board elections. I will turn the mic over to Ken. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the time and place for the annual election of officers. The officers for the Board of Vocational Nursing and Psychiatric Technicians are as follows, the President and the Vice President. Without objection, I will um, ask for nominations for the Office of President from the floor, meaning from the members present here today. I would nominate Tammy Ondozo for uh, President for calendar year 2020. Ms. Ondozo, do you accept the nomination? I accept. Are there any other nominations for the Office of President? Any further nominations for the Office of President? Hearing none, we'll proceed by roll call vote. I will ask that each member, when called, cast their vote by stating the name of the candidate that they we're voting for, even though we only have a, we have an uncontested uh, ballot here. Um, Ms. Norton? Yes, Tammy Andonzo. Mr. Sellers? Uh, Tammy Andonzo. Mr. Durking? Yes, Tammy Andonzo. <coughs> Dr. Vasta Martinez? Yes, Tammy Andonzo. Uh, Mr. Maxey? Yes, Tammy Andonzo. Ms. Carpenter? Yes, Tammy Andonzo. Dr. Mountain? Yes, Tammy Andozo. Ms. Rubicalva? Yes, Tammy Andozo. And Ms. Andozo? Yes, I accept. It's unanimous. The um, vote carries for Ms. Andozo. Now calling for nominations for the Office of Vice President of the Board. I would nominate Dr. Basti Martinez for Vice President for calendar year. Uh, 2020 of the BVNPT. Dr. Basto Martinez, do you accept the nomination? Yes, I do. I will now um, call the roll. Please follow the, the prior procedure. Um, Ms. Norton. Yes. Do you cast your vote from? Oh, Dr. sorry, for um, Dr. Basti Martinez. Thank you, Mr. Sellers. Uh, Dr. Basti Martinez. Mr. Deer King. Yes, Dr. Baste Martinez. Ms. Endoso. Yes, Dr. Baste Martinez. Mr. Maxi. Yes, Dr. Baste Martinez. Uh, Ms. Carpenter. Yes, Dr. Baste Martinez. Dr. Mountain. Yes, Dr. Baste Martinez. Ms. Rubicalva. Yes, Dr. Baste Martinez. Dr. Baste Martinez. Yes, I accept. Thank you. So Thank the you. vote is unanimous for um, Dr. Baste Martinez to serve as the vice president. Thank you. 
Thank you. So now we'll go on to board meeting minutes. Agenda item 12, review and approval of the November 22nd board meeting minutes. This is 12A and 12B is the February 3rd special board meeting minutes. As for the board meeting minutes of November 22nd, 2019, Madam President, there's no errors, omissions, or corrections. I would move the minutes from November 22nd. Second. There's a motion on the floor made by John, second by Bernice. Is there any discussion needed by board members? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Abstain, I was not there on Friday. Okay, so. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. I'm a yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. That will bring us to February 3rd board meeting minutes. Madam President, if there's no errors, omissions, or corrections, I would move the minutes from the February 3rd meeting. Thank you. I will second. Any discussion by board members? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? I abstain, I wasn't present. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Um, a yes, Ken? I abstain, I wasn't present. Alita? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you, motion carries. So we will do the Education Committee report, recommendations, and possible actions. So we will go Education Committee. Welcome, Cheryl. I'll turn it over to Dr. Mountain. Uh, the Education Committee met, and one of the things that we uh, discussed with um, Marie Cordaire was the fact that oftentimes the um, schools come and they present to us. We listen to what the NEC has to say, and then the schools come and present the exact same thing at the board meeting. So one of the issues that we've been working on is a standardized format that we could take notes from what the schools have presented, what the NEC says, and submit all of that to the board so that the schools would not have to make a second trip to these meetings. So that's one of the things that we are uh, at this time still working on the format and how that would uh, interface with this board. No action. And then the education division report. Yes, um, you have my report in front of you, but one thing I did want to um, call your attention to because I know you'd all be very interested is the Brightwood teach out. I have a report on the Van Nuys campus and also the San Diego campus. So as you can see, the uh, program director uh, for the Van Nuys campus notified myself and the NEC that effective January 31st, 
the June cohort of 21 students and the December cohort of 17 students graduated. No students were dropped and all the record of nursing programs were submitted to the board for processing. So that was very good news. I thought I wanted to share that with you. Uh, the San Diego campus, well you can see in the report, they still have uh, you know, a few cohorts uh, that will be graduating um, and have graduated and they've even um, got some NCLEX test results here in the report. And as you can see, they're very positive and they're very, um, very high. So I was very happy to see that as I'm sure all of you are. So uh, because I know everybody worked very hard on that. Um, again, the rest of the report is you can read, but, um, but my goal is to uh, do outreach. So you can see we had four uh, places where um, for events that we went and had outreach to, so very happy about that. Uh, the PT exam development and occupational analysis, yes, I know you've been waiting, it is coming. Uh, we've got a meeting scheduled with OPUS um, in two weeks, so they'll review that. I understand we do have the hard copy of that at the office, Geraldine just emailed me yesterday and said that we do have that. And then the last thing, we, um, Jeffrey, uh, one of our retired annuitants will be officially retiring um, from state service effective April 24th. We will not replace that position and we're able to absorb what he does uh, with the team. Any questions? Do board members have any questions for the education what? division report? Oh. Margarita, can I tell them about you? <coughs> well, we do have one more person who is leaving us, and I didn't really want to say because we're not happy about it, but Margarita Valdez will be retiring um, May 29th. Wow. And um, so that's going to be a hardship for our, you know, the education division because Margarita is an integral part of the team. Um, she will be missed, and uh, I don't, you know, other than that, I'm sure we wish Margarita well. I mean, I know we do, um, but uh, I, we will be able to replace her, and um, the first week in March, we'll be posting the NEC position, and we did announce it at the director's forum, and we did have uh, some interest of some program directors who did come up to me after the uh, meeting and, and ask a little bit about it. So we'll see. Anyway, Margarita, good luck. And you'll see Margarita at the May meeting also. So, but that will be her last meeting. So. Thank you. Madam President, uh, one of the things Margarita brought uh, was an understanding across cultures mm -hmm. and her bilingual, multicultural experience was a huge addition in the way they reviewed schools, and we want to thank her for that. Yes, we do. Thank you. And we would hope that uh, as you move forward that uh, there will be continued consideration about the diversity of the students because of the diversity in the California public, the public that we serve. Thank you. Any other comments from board members? Seeing none. So it's my understanding we had a few schools go through the education committee. If um, Carol would like to present. No? Give me a second, you guys. Sorry. So this is, we're on consideration of provisional approval for CNI College, CNI College Vocational Nursing Program. Um, Dr. Fairchild, we got the report. Um, do any board members have any questions regarding the report? Seeing none, is there a representative from the school? If you could state your name, your title, and I believe there's like a card up there. If you could write 
your name on that so that they can um, spell it correctly in the minutes. It would be appreciated. Um, do you agree with the um, recommendations? We and for CNA College, I do agree with the uh, recommendation. And Carol, was there a recommendation from the committee for this the, school? The committee recommends to support the recommendation of the CNE. Okay, and this was um, this came out of the committee, so. <clears throat> It's the motion and the second. Do any board members have discussion needed for this? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Seeing none, Ms. Fairchild, did you need to add anything? No, there's nothing to add to this one. Thank you. Thank you. We'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Emma, yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have 15C2 uh, Premier College Vocational Nursing Program. Thank you, uh, Ms. Fairchild. We got the um, report and recommendation, and I believe this one also went through our committee. Do board members have any questions for our NEC? Seeing none, is there any representative from this school? If you could state the name, title, and print your name on the card so that uh, they can spell it correctly. Mm -hmm. And do you agree with the recommendations from the NEC? Yes, I do agree. And my name is Ophelia Layugan, and I'm the Assistant Program Director for um, Premier Career College. Do board members have any questions for the school? Seeing none. And um, Carol, this went to the Education Committee also? Yes, the Education Committee voted to, on, to support the recommendations of the NEC. So there's a motion that came out of the committee, so it requires no second. Um, do board members have any questions or further discussion? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none. Do you have any further comments on Just this? Just a couple of things. Um, their program re director resigned February 7th, so the assistant director is the acting director at this moment. Mm -hmm. There's been no application submitted. And on page 12, violation one, the students that had the 175 hours of clinic time that was um, not included, they have made all of that up, so that violation has been corrected. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Does this change your recommendation? No. Okay. Thank you. Um, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. I'm a yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you for coming. So that brings us to 15C3, Los Angeles Unified School District, Maxine Waters Vocational Nursing Program. Um, this also went to committee, correct? Yes, it did. Um, does any board members have any questions for the NEC? Yes, Cheryl. <clears throat> I think the main problem was the lack of staffing. Um, and so were there any updates or any changes to that? There's been no changes in staffing their direct, because remember when we had the meeting, yes. the yeah. director was out. She's just now coming back this week. So there has been no, they've got a plan, but nothing has been submitted. Okay. 
All right. But they did hire a consultant, so they do have somebody coming in to help them. <coughs> then I do have a question. Yes, Given what you just told us, does that have any effect on your recommendations? No, ma'am. Any other board member questions? Seeing none, is there a representative from the school here present? If we could have you come up, state your name, and there's a card up there that you could write your name on so they can spell it correctly in the minutes. Um, do you agree or not agree with the NEC's recommendations? I agree with the NEC's recommendations. My name is Christine Ramirez. I'm from Maxine Waters Employment Preparation Center, and I'm the assistant principal there. One of the assistant principals. Thank you. And Carol, the recommendation from committee? The recommendation from the committee is to support the findings and recommendations from the NEC. Do any board members have questions for the school? I do. Okay, Donna. There was, there was some discussion about the, um, the number of hours that the director has. Has that been worked on? I think she only had like 10 hours and you guys were recommending that she get extra hours to do her duties. Has that been, has there been movement on that? Well, we are now working with a consulting agency and we're abiding by the recommendations from the NEC and and also the consulting agency. So the director hasn't gotten any increased hours? Not at this time. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, I believe during the meeting you had admitted about changing from daytime classes to nighttime classes, and then that was a decision that um, you had made and that was in violation of um, what we had given you in terms of your program. And so that you, you've acknowledged and you're correcting that. We're, yes, we're adjusting that based on um, what was approved. Okay. So there's no, no change to your recommendation? No change. Okay. Thank you. Any other board members have questions? Seeing none, there's a motion that came out of committee, so it requires no second, is to recommendation is to support the NEC's recommendation. Any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Motion Thank carries. You. So that brings us to 15D, request to admit students by programs on Excuse provisional. Me, Madam President. I just have a one, I'm just wondering if there, we did other things in the education committee, such as the uh, mechanical ventilation, we had a discussion on that. Also, the site and fine program, I'm wondering if we need to report out on that, or? Can you repeat the last thing you just said? So we had discussions about the site and fine program, and then there was public comment at the education committee about whether or not other, other boards do that. We also discussed the mechanical ventilation care program. Uh, I'm just wondering if we need to report on that, or if board members have questions about what went on there. I was deferring the mechanical ventilation to Elaine because it's a little more complicated than just our committee. Um, and the site and fine, I think we were just discussing that and it, there hasn't been any decision made on that at this time. Okay, I was just wondering if the <coughs> board members had any question on that. Actually, if I could respond. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair, Madam President. Um, right, we, we had a really good discussion at the Education Committee about both those items. Um, first being the site and fine program for schools. Um, as we discussed at the committee, and I think as we discussed with the Legend Regs Committee, um, we're looking at developing this this program, this language, 
um, to be included hopefully in our sunset legislation um, just by way of a fast background. You know, the board actually discussed uh, the creation of this program quite a few years in, in the running um, and, and had tried to include it in the 2017 sunset legislation. Um, this, this program would essentially give the NECs an additional tool working with the schools um, when they are s investigating, when they're doing site visits, when they're looking to improve the schools and work with the schools uh, management, you know, obviously at certain points they encounter violations ranging from very, very small minor things to things that are quite dangerous really for the students. Um, so when the, when the NECs note the violations, um, generally speaking, they'll offer the schools uh, a strong recommendation of please fix this within a certain period of time. Now, most of the schools work on this right away and, and resolve things on a very timely basis, but there are, of course, outliers who may need an extra, um, uh, we won't call it incentive, but an extra bit of, of pressure to, cre to correct their violations quickly and completely. Um, as I said, this is uh, adding another tool to the NEC's ability to, to work with their schools. Um, in a perfect world, actually, they'll never need to use it. But as I said, the status of this right now is we hope to include that um, in the sunset legislation. So we will be discussing that further along as we actually have a sunset bill in print. Now, as far as the mechanical ventilation, um, the care for patients on mechanical ventilation matter. We did again have a, a very good discussion at the committee level and, and again we, we spoke with it about this at Legend Regs and this is, um, this is an item that we resolved at the February special board meeting um, to attempt to move forward with this program and seek, <coughs> seek legislation for the year. Um, again, we haven't ha had a, a thorough resolution to this matter. This, um, there's still so much that needs to be done in terms of defining the parameters of this. Um, again, by way of background, um, the board is looking to create a post-licensure certification program for LVNs and PTs who take care of patients who are on mechanical ventilation. Now, the backstory is that we've been having a, a, a lot of discussions with the Respiratory Care Board about this item. And um, in the ensuing eight, 10 months, we've been discussing this with a lot of stakeholders, um, uh, employers, and care providers. Uh, we, we've been exploring a lot of different scenarios and a lot of different possible ways to, to make this best. But the bottom line, I think, for, for BVNPT is there are probably thousands of patients in California who are cared for by LVNs, PTs, who are on and are on mechanical ventilation? Um, I think the the short bottom line here is that somebody has to take care of these patients, and they need to be completely <coughs> trained and certified to provide that care. They need to be able to make sure that those patients are cared for completely, and um, there needs to be a consistent set of, of guidelines and criteria for that training, and there needs to be some regulatory action by this board. Um, so again, we have not been able to change our path just yet on that, but um, as I said, the uh, board did approve us uh, to at least try to find um, an author to help us move that forward. Um, we'll, we'll be having a great deal of discussions on this as we go forward. Madam Chair? Thank you. Do board members have further questions or? Okay. So we will go on to D1 Angeles Institute request to admit students. Um, thank you, Dr. Fairchild, um, for the report and recommendation. Do any board members have any questions regarding the report? Seeing none. Dr. Fairchild, do you have anything to add? All I want to say is that Brandy has been doing an awesome job and working really hard. And the first quarter of 2018, their pass rate was 62%. Uh, 
Um, the last quarter of last year, their pass rate was 79%. Thank you. Is there a representative from the school? So if you could state your name and print your name on the little card and let us know whether or not you agree with the recommendation from yes, Fanny C. I, I do. My name is Brandy Coward, Director of Nursing Angeles Institute. I agree. Do board members have any questions for the school? I do, just because <coughs> you've changed your pass rate yes, significantly. You were there throughout the entire time. Yes, ma'am. I, I think other colleagues might benefit from, could you like, from what you did, mm -hmm. maybe one or two things that you might point to that really helped to make the difference? I, I think a big thing was really communication and having the entire school part of the whole process. It had to be from the receptionist to myself to all staff members, realizing it has to be about student success, and that's what we have to get to. Uh, and if not everyone's on board, maybe they didn't need to work for us. It's a, it's a huge factor. Um, whatever the student might need as far as um, review materials, I don't think a single student can say that they never received items that they needed to be prepared. So they start getting those items way back in term one and they have them all the way throughout whatever they might need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And is there a motion? I move that we accept the NEC's report as written and adopt, the recommendation. and adopt the recommendation. I would second. Okay. So there's a motion and a second to accept the NEC's report and recommendations. Do board members need any further discussion? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. The motion is to accept the NEC's report and recommendations. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. A Bernice? Yes. Myself is yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you, motion carries. Thank you. That brings us to 15D2, Curum College Vocational Nursing Program. Thank you, Ms. Gomez, for the report. Do board members have any questions regarding the report for the NEC? Seeing none, um, is there a representative from the school here present? If we could have you state your name and write your name on the card and um, let us know whether or not you agree with the recommendation from the NEC. Okay. My name is Dr. Williams. I'm the owner and program director at Curb College of Nursing. Um, I accept and agree with the recommendation. There's a couple uh, things that I did want to say. I want to thank <clears throat> Jessica, Marie, and also Elaine for um, supporting us for the process of getting here today and also for having faith that we are going to be a different school and that um, most likely won't be in front of you guys again. Thank you. Um, I do want to mention though that uh, at the last meeting I did say that our pass rates were going to change significantly and the quarter after the meeting where I asked for six additional weeks, which of course we all know we didn't get, uh, the pass rates went up to 83% for the quarter. Last quarter were 82, and we are now just barely in compliance, I think, right? Just about 10% we're, we're getting there. So for, that, for last year, 53% for 69, 83, 82. I think we've made some significant changes. Um, and I also want to thank Dr. Mountain for referring me to the um, TEAS test prep that your college uses, very beneficial. We have been, we've implemented it. So quite happy 
um, to have got that information. Thank you very much. Yes, we do agree with the report. Thank you. Do board members have any questions for the school? The NECs, you did note that there was a significant change in the stat, in the um, rates, etc. Yeah, yes, I did. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, and that's one of the reasons why I did recommend the, the class. Okay, very good. Done. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Yes, I'll move that we accept the recommendation of the NECs and adopt, well, no, we adopt the report and accept the recommendations. I would second. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second to accept the report, adopt and accept the report <coughs> and the recommendations from the NEC. Any further discussion needed? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do roll call vote, Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. And a yes, Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you, motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. So we are on Institute Technology of Clovis 15D3. Um, thank you, Ms. Valdez. We've received the report. Do board members have any questions for the NEC? Seeing none, is there a representative from the school? If we could have you state your name and whether or not you agree with NEC's recommendation and if you could write your name on the card so that they spell it correctly. Um, yes, I'm Ron Gardner, campus president, and we agree. Thank you. Um, do board members have any questions for the school? Seeing none, Ms. Valdez, did you need to add any comments or anything? No, it's been um, very productive working with the director, Paula. She did a lot of changes that really have assisted the students at the school. Thank you, and we really appreciate your assistance over the time. Thank you. We'll miss you. Thank you. Um, is there a motion? I would move to receive the NEC's report regarding Institute of Technology Clovis and adopt the recommendations. Second. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to receive the report and adopt the recommendations from the NEC. Do board members need any more discussion? Just an observation, uh, Madam President. Uh, every time the school comes, they always have staff, but the president always comes with the staff, and the president now is before us presenting. Thank you. That is unusual. And unique. It's a good thing. It's very unique. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. So we are on 15D4, Mission College Psychiatric Technician Program. Um, thank you, Ms. Valdez. We received the report and recommendation. Do board members have any questions regarding the report for the NEC? Seeing none, is there a representative from the school? If we could have you state your name, your title, and whether or not you agree with the recommendation. Uh, my name is Marsha Oliver. I'm the director of the program, and yes, we do. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Valdez, do you have anything to add to the report? Glad to see Marsha as the director again. There's been a lot of changes. <laughs> I've worked with her before. Um, it did not go to the November board meeting uh, due to changes and things that were going on. 
Uh, we did agree on extending it for the year because they have not had a site visit or a PRS review, and she will be working on that. So um, looking forward to them coming back. They have no students at this time and have not requested any at this time. Thank you. Do board members have any questions for the school? Seeing none, is there a motion? I move that we accept the report in the recommendations of the NEC. Second. Thank you. We have a motion to accept the report and recommendations from the NEC. Is there further discussion needed? Seeing none, is there any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. I'm a yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. So we are at 15D5. <coughs> Northwest College Riverside Vocational Nursing Program. I have it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the report and recommendation. Um, do board members have any questions for the NEC? Seeing none, is there a representative from the school? And if you could state your name and title and whether or not you agree with the recommendations. Um, Dr. Catherine Silkey, uh, Northwest College, uh, Riverside Campus, DON, and uh, yes, I agree with the uh, NAC's recommendation. Do board members have questions for the school? Seeing none, is there anything you wanted to add? No. Thank you. Do we possibly have a motion for this? I'll move that we accept the report and the recommendations of the NEC. Second. So we have a motion and a second to accept the NEC's report. Um, do we need any more discussion from the board? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. I'm a yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. So we are on 15D6, Integrity College of Health. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. We got the report and recommendation. Do board members have questions? Seeing none, you have something to add, Ms. Gomez? I do. Uh, on Tuesday, I received the information that the program's BPPE approval was approved. So I would like to change my recommendations and remove number one and change number two to approve the class that they are requesting of 20 students to start on March 4th. Do board members have questions? Yeah, just as a change? clarification, the, the, the recommendation number one is changed? Uh, to remove that because they have the approval for uh, BPPE now, so we don't need to watch for that approval to come in. Okay, thank you. Okay, is there a representative from the school present? If we could have you state your name and whether or not you agree with the um, updated recommendation from our N NEC. Yes, my name is Alice Sorrell Thompson, and I am the director of the Vocational Nursing Program for Integrity College of Health. And yes, we do agree with the updated approval of our NEC. Do board members have any questions for the school?
Seeing none, is there a motion? Yes. I move that we accept the updated or amended report of the NEC and adopt the updated or amended recommendation of the NEC. And I second. Who was, uh, Carol, did you second? Thank you. So we have a motion to accept the amended report and recommendations from the NEC. Do we need any discussion by board members? Seeing none, um, is there any public comment? Seeing none, thank you. And we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Uh, Bernice? Yes. Tammy? Yeah, yes. <laughs> sure. uh, Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you. Uh, that brings us to our agenda item 13, Executive Officer's Report. Thank you, Madam President. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, the board has received my written report. Um, I would add a couple of very good, note, good notes. Um, one is our new licensing manager uh, has begun work, actually, as of Tuesday. Her name is Shelly Brown, and she has, was most recently in a, quite a similar capacity at the Department of Insurance. Um, she's already taken... Um, Great amount. In fact, her second day was taken up with uh, interviewing for some PT2 uh, vacancies um, and other somewhat, somewhat mostly good and little sad news. I think the, you all saw the note in um, our enforcement chief's report that um, our intake manager, Matt McLean, has accepted another position at the Bureau of Cannabis Control. And um, we're very pleased to announce that. Um, in the, moving into that position will be Mr. Darwin Agar, who up to now has been one of our special investigators. He's been with the board quite a long time. We're very excited to have him. He's got a tremendous amount of, of energy and excitement. So we're looking forward to having Shelly and Darwin as part of our leadership team. Um, and before I move into budget stuff, was there, if the board members had any questions? Great. Um, we wanted to um, bring before you the the board's budget um, and the fun analysis of fund condition. Um, first off, actually, let me let me start actually with the fund condition. Um, this actually reflects the governor's budget as uh, with a comparison from the prior year, um, this current year. The governor's budget is that middle column, and this pr projects us out. Um, up to four years, a so budget year to budget year 2024-25. Now, as we've talked about a number of times, um, the fund condition numbers are derived from from basic analysis of, of past year work, and as as we've discussed, our our, our numbers have been a little bit uh, shaky. Let's just call them. Uh, in as much as, like every other department in California, um, we've been hindered by the less than full implementation of the fiscal system. Um, I'm very pleased to an announce, though, that we have finally been seeing closed numbers for fiscal year 2016-17, 2017-18. And did we get 19 yet? We have not. We have not received 2018-19 just yet. Um, so in as much as we don't have final, final numbers from the fiscal system. The DCA budget unit does provide us with, with some preliminary not closed numbers, so there's still quite a bit of, of margin for change, let's call it. Um, so basically when you project on something that's not certain, not finalized, there is a, a little bit of a room for um, possibly not being the best projection, let's just say. Um, so the governor's budget has moved forward 
Um, as you know, the governor presents his overall budget for the state in January, um, DCA and our board, of course, being part of that. Um, the projected budget was ever so slightly higher um, than our, our last year's budgeted level. Um, and it projects out with a something like a 3% for inflation um, each year going forward. Now, again, what we've talked about in terms of our fund condition is um, the revenue projections from the, the from the department um, show us at just a flat projection out for the next five years. Um, they the analysis is not able to accommodate any sort of adjustment um, for changes in our licensing population. Um, that's, that would require a great deal more analysis from our staff, which we're, we're working on as well. Um, but they, this, these numbers also don't include, of course, um, the new fee that we do propose in ter um, with the schools. Now, our last research and our last analysis showed that at the, the number we'd been considering would bring in something like $1.2 million a year additional. Um, given a variety of other factors, which we'll get into in a second, um, the staff is looking at a variety of different number scenarios. We're, we're going to be doing a lot of projection and a lot of real hard choices, I think, going forward. Um, but we will, of course, have a real projected number to, to present soon. Um, again, this is going to be something that we hope to include in our, our sunset report. Um, I do know that, and I'll get back to the sunset report as a whole. Um, so we do not have specific language right now as to the, the, the school program fees. Um, so as I said, our fund condition report shows us moving into deficit in terms of budget year three, 22-23, um, which is unfortunate. Um, but th these numbers, I think, were, were drawn out as late as end of December. Now, in the meantime, the, the budget office at DCA has given us um, some preliminary numbers in terms of this fiscal year. Um, so actually, I'm, I'm sneaking in and, and moving into our own budget. And our projected numbers for this current budget year show us actually moving into deficit this year. Um, a great deal of this, again, as, as we've discussed, has to do with the sudden and very large increase in rates from the Attorney General's office. Um, right now, we are working on a budget change proposal um, for to amend that. Um, we believe that that would be mitigating a great deal, if not all, of, of that number. Um, but we've had a number of since we're finally seeing real numbers, a, a number of surprises come coming forward just in this past few weeks. Um, we, generally speaking, um, when the, we don't have a lot of input into the development of the budget. We are just given these round numbers, and generally speaking, um, where there have been some fluctuations, where there have been some shortfalls, They've also they've usually been mitigated by surpluses in other line, so that as long as the bottom line is still in the black, um, we haven't had a problem. Um, so we're finding though that this year, again, principally because of um, our, our unexpected large expense for enforcement, um, we don't have that that cushion, if you will. Um, we're going to be looking at a great many of um, belt tightening missions, um, one of which is we are going to hold back on filling a few positions. Um, Margarita, Margarita, of course, we, we do need an NAC, but I think um, we have two retired annuitants who have decided to actually really retire. Um, we will not be filling those at all. We have some fluctuations in some other positions that we will hold off on filling until the first of the fiscal year. Um, we've made a number of other economies. Um, we're mostly, mostly um, looking to curtail a lot of 
other line items. Um, we're not going to be having staff go to any training that's outside DCA that entails a fee or travel. Um, we're looking at our travel expenditures. Um, essentially, we've always been very, very frugal, but at this point, we're trying to make sure that we're planning well in advance so that um, we can get the best possible fees, of, excuse me, rates for, for airfare, for accommodations, um, and things in that vein. Uh, we'd like to recommend, actually, that the board's committees, with the exception of the education committee, meet via phone at least through the end of this fiscal year, if not the end of this calendar year, to save some money. Um, as I said, but I, but I want to, to make sure that this uh, doesn't unduly alarm the board members because the nature of, of looking at preliminary numbers is that a lot changes from, from month to month to month and, and a lot changes after the end of the fiscal year but and when the books are, are officially closed and, and, and analyzed. So generally speaking, I, I, think there, I think there's cause for concern but I wouldn't say that, that we are in a great deal of, of fiscal danger. Now, however, I, I did want to point out, and this is a very, very important um, item of, of concern and priority for the board, is a lot hinges on our ability to secure this new fee for the schools. Um, should we not be able to, to implement that fee structure, um, the board will have to consider raising applicant licensee fees again. Remember that that, that, that most recent fee increase uh, took effect January of 2019. Um, we had hoped that we would have a, a good five or six years before we would need to look to raising those fees again, um, especially since, you know, historically uh, this board has been completely funded by our applicant licensee fees. We believe it's more than time for, for the programs to provide some of our revenue. Um, but just just as a point of reference, um, again, should we not be successful in, in, a, in creating that school fee, um, the numbers we've been looking at would entail us raising the applicant licensee fees in excess of $40 a, a year per, or per licensing period as early as 2021. Um, I'll pause here for some questions. Yes, when did this, the student or applicant licensee fee increase go into effect? Did you remind me? Our current fees went into effect January of 2019. Um, what we're looking at, we're, we're actually um, looking at a vast number of projections of if this, then this. Um, I think if we need to change the existing fees, it would go into effect possibly as early as 21, but more likely in 22. So you said they went into effect on the 19th? That's correct. All right. And what impact did that have? I mean, <laughs> well, it, it's a broad we, question. It, it's a broad question. Uh, let, me, let me see if I, if I can clarify that a little bit. The effect it had, of course, was that we had a lot of licensees complain but, <laughs> but, but in terms of our budget, it was actually quite a significant in, uh, increase in our revenue. Okay. And we increased it by? Um, they went up somewhere in the neighborhood of, I think, about $30 per, per applicant. I can certainly find you the, the exact yes. numbers. I believe they're actually on our web page. And what is the cost for uh, LVN or LPT to renew their license at this time? Right now it's 220 I believe it was only 185 Previous to uh, going up, the LVN fees were 155 and, um, and And as a footnote, we also adjusted the psych techs fees so that they were par with the LVN fees. Beforehand, they had been significantly higher to cover their exam costs. And at least towards the end of last year, we had reduced our meeting times as we were going through transitioning as far as the committee is concerned for the board. We were transitioning to um, creating and consolidating 
committees and mm -hmm. reassigning board members to various committees. So that should have reduced our travel expenses somewhat. Somewhat. Okay. Um, and Moving your, from eight, to, or eight or nine committees to five committees. All right. Yes. And you're recommending, although we haven't voted or implemented, make, calling in for all committees except for the education committee. Um, so maybe I'm making more of a statement, but I just hope that uh, we can make adjustments without increasing the applicant's fee by, fees by a significant amount. I would agree with you completely. Okay. <laughs> and I think our licensee members are, would, agree are, are, me too. would agree with you completely. Okay. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Just an observation, you know, one of the biggest challenges became the change in fees um, from, well, the Attorney General's office, yes. of which we have absolutely no control, but because of the <laughs> business of the board, we must have that kind of support. So given the fund condition, at least what we're looking at, as a board, and of course I know an exec, we've been talking about this, but as a board, we really will need to think outside of the box. Some of the things that have been suggested are short-term remedies. I mean, there, for example, increase the licensee fees. That can only work for so long and at some point licensees will say no more <laughs> um, some of the other things about how often committees meet face to face uh, there are some times when it really is necessary for everyone to be in the room so those are short-term remedies at this time do you believe if we really focus, if we ask for maybe some consultative help, maybe from DCA, that by the end of the fiscal year or at least the calendar year, we might be able to come up with some different kinds of remedies that we could apply I would hope we might take that kind of path. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, let me actually, I am so, uh, so glad that you asked that and, 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 and commented thus. Um, at this point in time, our staff has been working fairly exhaustively with the DCA budget mm -hmm. staff, and what we hope to do in the next weeks is start working to go line by line by line with the budget office and identify some of the areas where we believe um, their numbers are not um, accurate, let's just say. Um, that they're not, they're not based on the real, our, our, our real um, projections, our real workload. So we'll be, we'll be doing that over the next two weeks or so, uh, hopefully to make some uh, some suggestions. We hope to be able to offer some some uh, adjustments um, that would be able to be taken into account in the budgets may revise, um, and that I think, um, in terms of a long term permanent structural fix, that we hope to get our overall budget really looking like what it takes to run this board. So yes, long term wise, we we are looking to do that. And long-term wise, I think actually um, our revenue stream as a whole really does need to be analyzed. Um, we can't balance our budget based on fees um, to our licensees. Um, we need to create some other uh, some other structures, some other ways of doing things. And what we'll need to we'll need to start analyzing our our programs. Um, I think I, I mentioned before that I think it's a little bit ironic that um, our workload with the AG's office and with OAL and OAH, um, ironically, our bill's a little higher than we 
would have even seen with the increase because our enforcement staff has been doing such a great job in getting cases work, run through the system. Um, our, our discipline manager has told me that we have never had so many cases out, at, out in the court before. So we're, we're, we're paying a lot more because we're doing a lot better. Um, and as a, as a footnote to that, I, I think the board should, should also note that um, because our caseload has been so high over the past few years, um, because we've been clearing out a significant backlog, historic backlog, um, at some point it will plateau and start decreasing. Um, the problem is, is that won't happen right away. Um, our enforcement chief and I believe that we're looking at probably about two years more of a really high level of activity before that starts to plateau. I have a question. <clears throat> so on that note, I know the AG's office has increased their hourly rate. Are they also, have they also increased the number of hours that they're billing? Yes. Okay. Because the rate is, is, is a, you know, billable hours. All right. Um, and so then there has to be a correlation between their increased hours and increased workload on the board, which also means that if we're, if they're working doing more cases, the board members are working doing more cases, and then that means we're billing based on our caseload as well. So that's high and they're high, and um, so that's an issue. Um, we've made changes to how the board members bill for their limited pay that they receive, which is not really pay. Um, so you just have to keep that in mind, and we can only go down so low. We've already given up our travel time as well as uh, our per diem, which under the law was provided for us uh, in some instances. So, um, so I just keep that in mind, that there is a correlation. Actually, actually the, um, the petitioner hearings and mail ballots are a very, very small part of that workload. The majority of the workload has to do with um, our our investigations and, and moving directly over to the department. You're talking about in terms of costs, because for our yes. as, as far as our time is concerned, yeah, it takes time to go the time. The all time those is cases. Yes, the time is not the, not the issue. The the amount of money um, to hold the disciplinary hearings and to, for the board members' compensation for for processing the ballots is a very, very small amount. That's, that doesn't really touch on the Attorney General's bills. Elaine, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, our enforcement division has been working to clear the backlog, basically, of cases that we have. And the high rate of cases that we've sent over there is, at some point, will clear our back backlog. And that's, that's why correct. currently the AG's office fees are high. The AG's office fees Yes, that's short answer, yes. May, may I ask two questions? Um, first, where, where are we with the implementation of the school fees? What is the current status on that? As I said, right now we're, we hope to incorporate that in our sunset legislation. I know that it will be a topic of discussion at our hearing. Okay. But um, in terms of the actual structuring, um, our staff has been working to analyze the, um, the specific workloads of the NECs and projecting out um, if that changes at all given the number of schools, the number of schools on our wait list. Um, so as I said, we're, we're doing a lot of statistical analysis um, based on where we think that workload is gonna go over the next five or, or more years. What, what, what are the best and worst case scenarios as far as the implementation? You mean in terms of time or yeah, in terms of yeah. number? When would you hope to see it, and when? How long could it drag up before it, before we did see it? <laughs> well, as I said, our, our best case scenario right now is that we get the statutory authority this year, and we are able to make this the law of the land as of January first. Now, the num the the date of which we specifically implement the f the fees imposition. Um, that is, is still part of where it, we're a little squishy. Um, it could be as early as um, the beginning of the fiscal year, so that would be July 1 of 21. 
Um, it could be a little bit later if we have um, a little bit more room. And I'd, I'd like to be able to provide a little bit more time, because I, especially for the programs like community colleges that budget two year in, in advance. Um, but, you know, this isn't going to be an annual fee on the schools. This is based on their approval cycle. So if you're on a continuous approval for a four-year period of time, your fee is based on that four-year cycle. If you're on a provisional approval um, and you're looking for your reapproval every two years, that's that cycle. So it, it's, it's, a little, it's, it's tremendously layered. Um, but as I said, I, I, the problem, of course, is that no matter when the fees go into effect, full implementation, um, we don't start realizing any of that revenue. Probably, I would think, for at least six months, if not a whole fiscal year, there's so many changes that need to be made in, in our accounting systems as well as accounting for that in, in, in Breeze. So right now we're, we're actually starting to plan that out to make that make those changes so that everything would be ready to essentially flip the switch when we we have that authority so two two two, two to three years something in that range before we actually saw no more like one one and a half to two okay and and, and excuse my naivete on this um in the real world of a business runs in the black by excuse me the red by Three quarters of a million dollars, it, and they lock the doors, and everybody goes home. What what happens in the world of of, of government? How how is this well, going forward? One of a couple of things happens. One being, if if our if our situation, if our fund condition is so dramatically in the red, um, we are forced to ask for essentially an emergency appropriation. Now, remember though, this is still our own money that we're spending. So when we would ask for legislative authority to ameliorate a, a deficit, it kind of just punts the ball downfield a little ways. So truthfully, we have to do a little bit more analysis. Um, we have to do a little bit more planning, I think, to really adjust the in, in and out. But, um, but you're right. A deficit like that is significant um, for a budget that's just over – Somewhere in the 17 and 19 million dollars a year, it, it's a significant deficit. But uh, um, I also think, though, that by the end of the fiscal year, that deficit will prove out to be significantly lower than that number. Th th thank you, Lena. I have a question. How does this compare to other boards, and what is <laughs> what, what is kind of this, um, the strategy they are taking within DCA? Um, it, are we taking heed from? Or are we? Are we learning from other examples, or are we kind of leading the way? I would like to say that we were leading the way. Every board who has to do enforcement has the same challenge before them. Um, every board, every department in California has the same issue with fiscal, that we've been operating not exactly with really, really good, clean numbers. Um, now, in terms of our, our, of our own situation, you know, I, I actually had a meeting with... Um, with agency and with our, our new director. And I said, this is really important that we need to be able to, you know, I implement this fee. We need to be able to do this because, you know, we're going in the red. And um, I, I was told off the record somewhat that our board's fiscal situation is not the worst in, in, the, in the DCA world. Um, so... There were there were boards that needed to be in the bailout um, this year, and not two years from now, which is when we think we would be really scraping the bottom without any any changes in our revenue. Is it possible from after this meeting that we could get, you know, kind of a compare contrast and some of the, what the other boards are doing around their fees? Sure. And and how that compares and how we can kind of move forward if in fact we decide as a board to move forward with this. That's a really good idea. Um, I, had, I had been looking at, and I was going to work with the executive committee. Um, as you know, in the, the board meetings that were in Sacramento, we spend um, the Wednesday um, doing some, some board training and board um, discussion. Um, and one of the things that we had, we had hoped to discuss was having the DCA budget and possibly Department of Finance and come and, and work with us and provide some background information 
and I think do a little bit better of a job uh, showing how that structure works and when things really do change. But it, it, I, I think that I think that'd be a terrific idea of um, providing a little bit more analysis of our, you know, closest cousin boards and and their their fee situation. So I'm happy to to do that as well. Thank you. I have a question. Well, not really a question, but. If we're thinking outside the box, so as I understand this board, it's self-funded, which means we rely completely upon applicant fees and renewal fees and some other, and one of the things that we haven't talked about is cost recovery. If we're thinking outside the box, the way to, to curtail our expenses is to curtail the amount of enforcement that needs to happen. So if we looked at what we can do if we don't have so many people that are getting into trouble, we won't have to spend so much tr time sending things to the OAG. I think I recall years back where we weren't sending a whole lot over there, which was creating a backlog. We were in a better fund condition then because we weren't spending all that money. So now we're doing a better job in enforcement, but now we have a, a worse fund condition. So my question here is where on this sheet, and because I can't remember, but I, I, I think I recall at one point someone saying that cost recovery wasn't figured into the budget because there was no guarantee that you were ever going to get the cost recovery. So is that an area that we can look at? Because it seems that if we're spending thousands of dollars to investigate a case and then we remove someone's license, if they never seek to get their license back, then we, that is just money lost and so be it. But we also have a lot of cases where they'll come for a reinstatement and they haven't paid their fees. So, I mean, I think with the amount of enforcement costs that we have, we do have to look outside the box, and, th and we can't just keep raising fees on our, on our licensees, because we didn't not only raise the applicant fee, we raised the renewal fee. Right. So, um, I guess within that whole conversation there, the question is, where in this budget is cost recovery? It's never been put into a budget, per se, because it's... it's one of those things that's impossible to, to really um, quantify and time out. But you're right in the fact that we do have a significant amount owed to us through through the cost recovery. Um, it's difficult to collect, but I know that the, um, the board this past few months has been very, very careful to make sure that um, when you are doing the disciplinary hearings to make sure that, that cost recovery is in uh, the full payment before they are allowed to have their license back it, it, is in their agreement. Now, in terms of the historic, um, we are able to work to make sure that the um, folks who are in discipline, especially those who are probationers, um, before they are allowed to practice again, do pay the entire cost. The problem historically, of course, has been that if folks surrender their licenses, we don't really have a great deal of ability to, to collect. We're forced to work with um, the Franchise Tax Board to work, with, to work on um, like putting a lien on, that, on these individuals. And that has not been, let's say, a glowing success. There is, I said, as I said, a, a significant amount of money that we don't think we'll ever see come back. And these, this goes back numbers of years. Decades, would you say, Jay? Yes. Decades. Um, now at this point, um, the enforcement staff um, has been working to really analyze where those, those costs and where those recovery points are and can be and to look into a way to, first off, better chart that, but second off, to develop a way that we can find some, some means of, of recovering. Um, you know, it's going to take uh, cooperation with Franchise Tax Board um, and a few other uh, of the, the state's fiscal entities. But we, we have been looking at that. But it's not reflected in this because it's just too weird of a number um, because it's been building up over decades. Um, but I think moving forward, hopefully by the end of the, at least this calendar year, we should probably be able to have a plan in place that we would be able to start seeing some of that recovery come back. Would you, is there a, would you say that we're getting 
15% of our cost recovery? Are we getting 20% of our cost recovery? Do we have any firm numbers of how much cost recovery we've actually been able to, to receive? We really don't. And that's part of what the staff has been spending a lot of time analyzing right now. So again, I think we have an opportunity here to thinking way outside the box. If you're trying to cut down costs on enforcement, we should probably cut down the number of people that have to be enforced. So I don't know if there's an education thing that we can do, or I know that I hear it as I'm out working in the field. Um, our licensees want to know why they're paying so much. And when you explain to them that it's a self-funded board, it's completely by the number of licensees, the number one thing I hear, why do we pay more than the RNs do? They make more. Well, there are more of them. So I don't think there is a real understanding in the field about what is entailed. And so I think so. a lot of that results in a negative view of the board and a negative view of of what is going on here. So I think thinking outside the box, we should probably do a better outreach for that. And we should really look into, or I would like to know if we're, so that I can look at this and go like, oh yeah, we're in really bad shape, but there's a cushion, although it be flex, you know, like not a firm cushion, but like, are we getting 50% of the cost recovery? It would also probably stop some of the conversations that we're having in discipline hearings about wanting to do away with cost recovery because we feel badly for the licensee. We feel badly for them, yes, but we also feel badly for the ones that are having to pay for that. They didn't even get themselves into trouble because if we're not recovering that cost one way, we're raising fees on the others. So, Elaine, I just want to make sure I'm hearing the response about recovery fees. Minimally, could we get a figure of what's collected within a fiscal year? Certainly. And if we had maybe three years of what the total figure was, it might help us see, even if it fluctuates, but it gives us a better picture of what's happening. We should be able to project that um, to move back to, you're, you're speaking of moving back to accounting or moving forward to projecting? I'm not speaking about projecting anything. That's fair. In a fiscal year, so much is collected. Is yes. that correct? That's correct. What's that number? We and could we fine. have maybe three years of what that number was. was? We should be able to find that. Which would give us some sense of what might be recognizing it's always going to fluctuate. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe we even have a sense of what's collected in one year. No, I, I think you're correct in that. I, I think that um, when the, the department's uh, budget office um, shows out the revenue, it's not clearly line-itemed out where that falls but it should be able to be identified. We should be able to, to identify that and pull that number out, at least in a, a fairly rough number. Um, we should be able to look at that in comparison to what the enforcement staff is, is analyzing in terms of what we know has been um, assessed out to the, the, the probationers and, and the folks who've gone through discipline. We should be able to, to create that kind of analysis for the board request that we could see that number by the next executive committee meeting? Maybe not that quickly, but certainly as, as soon as we can. I, I, it's just the amount collected each of the last three fiscal years. No, I, I know exactly what you mean. It, it's That's all. No, I agree. I agree. Thank we'll, you. we'll do our best Thank for you. you. So, question, uh, you, maybe you're going to ask the same question, but is it reflected anywhere what we've collected? And where is it? Uh, okay, you have a different question. Okay. Are we sure that the cost recovery comes back to the board would be question number one? No, it definitely does. Well, while Ms. Yamaguchi is looking for that, um, legally, the 
there are two uh, programs uh, through which the, um, the board collects most of the funds. One is for active probationers. They're required legally to uh, pay the cost reimbursement during the period of probation. So the probation intake process accounts for that. So funds are created or are, are collected. Um, a program is created and the funds are collected as a result of the intake process. And um, so uh, most of the funds that are collected as cost recovery are through probation. The other major source uh, is the Franchise Tax Board um, Tax Refund Offset Program, which uh, um, collects monies um, that would otherwise go to tax refunds uh, for the enforcement of obligations to various government entities, including uh, the board. So the board uh, collects money in that way. Those are the two primary sources at this point of the uh, cost recovery. So are you saying that we should be able to find cost recovery reflected in income from probation? The probation program is um, where most of the cost recovery is collected from. Yeah. But I mean, in terms of um, as our statement of financials, the actual document that we that the board reviews. Uh, well, that's okay. an accounting question. I, I don't know yeah. the answer. To that. Okay, so legally, uh, uh, th those are the two programs that are, are um, uh, on the books legally <laughs> to collect money from that results in the vast majority <laughs> of the funds that are collected okay. uh, through the cost recovery program. Okay. Right. All right. So my my sense of this uh, on the read of the document is um, we have a number of revenue accounts and they're as specifically labeled th as things like other regulatory fees, miscellaneous income, and um, we would be needing to, to analyze those two lines to see those patterns there. I, can I, I'd like to um, add on to Donna's suggestion that we had talked about, and, I, and, and Paula and myself developed a letter, I think we passed it off to the Education Committee about an outreach program to the schools, the vast majority of the cases that we see are drug and alcohol <coughs> cases. And I even think with alcohol, there's still a disconnect between uh, what, 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 how, we, how we view it here at the board and what the perception by uh, the nurses are. And I think that there's an opportunity there to at least, at least uh, educate them on, uh, and, and, and as Donna suggested, <coughs> potentially reduce the number of violations with a, with a concerted education effort. So I just, I just want to say, I think that is actually a, 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 an avenue that we've already started to um, look into and, and I think we should continue to pursue. I know it also, uh, Alita, go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know if this is possible, but I think it would be helpful to have percentages, the percentage that's actually connected, collected versus the amount that is owed. I think that that would be very helpful. Is that something that can be done? Probably, probably. Thank you. Sure. But I also know previously, at, uh, it's been a while since it's been discussed, but we were looking at different avenues besides the um, income tax and that to retrieve the cost recovery. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Jay, we were looking at that in the enforcement committee. It's been like, uh, I want to say like two years since we've discussed it previously. There was some talk of using something like private collection agencies, but again, that will cost money as well. Well, there was also some discussion, Ken, about uh, including language that would allow us to, to collect in other means. Is there any movement on that? Yes, um, there have been developments in the probation intake process that allow for more efficient collection. Other items that were discussed in the past were uh, the possibility of um, requiring the execution of a promissory note <coughs> in connection with the probation intake process. And the promissory note could be enforced if necessary uh, additionally, the 
cost awards themselves could be enforced in the manner of a money judgment, although that would uh, require the development either of a, an internal program to uh, enforce the judgment or referral to an outside third party collection agency, which would um, collect and uh, recover on a percentage fee basis. So those are other options that have been discussed in the past. Um, at this point, what's been implemented um, based on those suggestions is um, our, our changes to the uh, probation intake process. Thank you. I think um, <coughs> looking at the totality of the problem, um, I think our best effort is in prevention, just like in healthcare. Our best effort is in prevention because once they get into the, like when they're, for the most part, I think when they're in school and they're learning about this and learning about the toll that it will take on their life is the time to get them to understand the totality of what it will, will be for them. When they're in the throes of the alcohol or the drug addiction and they've, They've gone through that and now they're on probation and there's a cost to being on probation and albeit they did bring it on themselves, but I still think prevention is the key and there's an opportunity for um, thinking way outside the box. Maybe we can work with the schools to get, um, maybe we can institute a program that people that have lost their license and went through it can go speak to them, sort of, you know. Just thinking way outside the box here, but prevention is the key. Otherwise, we will have to keep raising our fees. And that just seems like a, um, yes, that's a lagging instead of a leading. I'm wondering, going off um, what Donna's suggesting, is there a way that possibly that can be worked in with the education committee and the NECs for the schools to start there where the, um, well, the students are learning? Um, yes, certainly. And also, um, we, you know, and I put the question out to the directors here. I'm sure that as I did, these directors talk to their students and they must take their licenses seriously. And I always say, you know, we are held to a higher standard than the general population. So when you have a potential to lose your license, that's your livelihood. It's going to cost you money. It's going to cost you a whole lot more than a couple of thousand dollars. So I know that all the directors here probably um, speak to that with their students. Many of them I know review... Um, the Nursing Practice Act with them and talk about uh, things like this, taking them to the, re the uh, hearings as they did yesterday. Um, but um, as you said, Donna, addiction is addiction, and it's sometimes very hard to get a handle on that, and they're just – sometimes – People don't make the best decisions, as you well know sometimes. So, but yes, I mean, we could certainly, uh, it could be a topic for discussion at our director's forum. That would be something that we could do. Um, and the team here, they all have such great ideas, so we can definitely look at that. And, um, you know, I try to communicate with the directors via, uh, all the program directors via an email, so that is something that we definitely could could put out, and I, I think it's definitely something we can work on. So, the the other thing I wanted to say is that we, as NECs, when we do our site visits, we do have an opportunity to just talk to the students. And one of the things that we do present in our talks with the students is the different departments of the board and how they will move from one department from us, and then they will be going to the licensing, and then what enforcement. And they ask many questions many times because Jess and I have been, and we will tell them. We will tell them that it will be hard to get those licenses back, to be careful the choices they make, to be aware of their scope of practice, because that will affect their licenses in making those decisions. Like they sometimes say, well, the hospitals will say we have to do this, and we get a lot of those questions on scope of practice, and we say, no, you know what it is. You cannot, you must stand up for it. They're going to put you in a position 
that it's going to jeopardize your license. But that is something, like Ms. Cordero said, that we can present and we can expand on when we meet with our directors. Since we're kind of thinking outside of the box, I, I, know, I mentioned earlier that I, I think the vast majority of our cases that we see are alcohol related. Is there an opportunity to streamline the way we process those those cases? Uh, more of a, a template or something? If somebody's willing up front to just accept, uh, I don't know. I'm just like I said. Is there a way? Since that's a big part of what we're, what we're dealing with. We actually we, have done a lot of streamlining with those cases. <laughs> we actually have done some significant streamlining of that through our fast track program. So a lot of the DUI and alcohol related arrests run through the fast track program. Okay. So I think you will see over the next six months to a year, year and a half, a decrease in those numbers. And um, it has been a big benefit to the board. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Elaine or comments? None. Good. Um, the last thing I wanted to comment about, of course, is, is updates on our, our sunset review. Um, we've been given two potential dates, March 17 and March 24, but the schedule of hearings has not been finalized. In other words, I don't know which of those two dates we will be um, moving forward. We have also not received um, the follow-up uh, background paper and questions. Um, although conversations with, with legislative staff and with, with leadership in the department have sort of confirmed what we believe um, there would be interest in, in discussing, of course. Um, there are all the things that were identified in our Sunset Report narrative, um, our fees, the site and fine program, the mechanical ventilation care issue, um, and essentially a, a real good look at our statistical trends. Um, so we, we feel like we have a great deal to talk about. Uh, we're just waiting to be provided with a little bit of direction on what the priorities from the committee will be. Um, but as I said, <laughs> it, it would be really, really helpful to, to have the actual date so that we could plan and a document that we could, could work toward. Um, as it stands, you know, it looks as though we would have somewhere in the neighborhood of two weeks to turn around our responses to any questions. Um, it's quite a, lot, a, a very tight turnaround. Um, but as I said, we're, we're, we feel like our, our sunset review, we're, we're working from a very strong position. So. Thank you. Do board members have any questions? Okay. So we're going to go to the executive committee. We met and um, looked at all of the, heard about all the committee meetings. And we found that on our calendar for 2021, um, we're going to ask the board to move the August meeting in 2021 from, I believe it was the 14th to the 21st, uh, the 20, 20th through the 21st. Um, because the week previous um, conflicts with the NCSBN's annual um, meeting. And then on the board member attendance um, report, I believe Donna, you had a discrepancy on that? I did. They left off meetings that I attended, and then um, it's noted that I didn't attend the Education Committee, and so rightly so, I was under the impression that I wasn't on the committee, but as Elaine pointed out to me, I actually was on the committee because I had just accepted appointment to the committee, but I didn't get an invite to the meeting, so I take a, I, I kind of like don't like that it says that I didn't attend, but I understand it. But there was some discrepancy in board member attendance. Right, and I appreciate you pointing that out. We, we went back and looked and uh, corrected that, and that, I believe I sent out an updated chart to, to the board. Yes, thank you. 
Thank I you. Take attendance very seriously. <laughs> As you yes, you should. Um, and then you have the the meeting minutes in your packet. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, I guess I did have one question. I noticed that there was a budget change proposal for the NEC. Are we still planning to? Is that still moving forward? It looks like it was going to be July 2020. Yes, it is. If I'm not mistaken, Elaine, that was the one that we got awarded for the new fiscal. That's correct. It will take effect July 1. Um, and and as, I, uh, as Donna pointed out, it was approved by Department of Finance, which means it's part of the governor's budget. Um, nothing, of course, is finalized until the budget itself is finalized. But it is you know, I included in ours. Thank you. And then for the, we'll take up the motion for the calendar at, when the calendar comes up on our agenda. That brings us to the licensing division report and recommendations. Are we going to take a break or go straight through to lunchtime? Do you want to do that? Yes. Can we just take a five minute about Restroom 15 break. <laughs> so we'll we'll take a 15 minute break and come back at 11:05 and then we'll take up the licensing division report. Okay? Thank you. to get started with the licensing division report and recommendations and possible actions and Elaine thank you madam president um, y'all have received Vicki's excellent report um, complete with a, a vast amount of statistical data the the division has been keeping track on about 60 something specific data fields um, from 2017 to 2019 broken out by months and we've seen virtually every metric going in the right direction um, every, since in this three-year period. Um, it's really exciting to look at um, just some, some things that I think uh, are really noteworthy to report is just this enormous decrease in the, in the number of incoming calls and um, a lot of things account for this, one being that we have a very good, dedicated, um, and enthusiastic team over there. We've been reorganizing the, the division as a whole, and um, essentially all these things combined with the fact that about 96% of our licensees re renew and, and use Breeze actively, um, that cuts down a lot of the, the call volume. Um, the fact that our licensing uh, um, analysts have gotten to the point where processing times are, are so quick that again that cuts down our call volume and our, our, our problems. Um, so overall the division has been doing such a, a super job but the one thing that I think is, is really really noteworthy is the one field that truthfully I never thought would, would move this dramatically is in the processing of our equivalency applications. Um, we are down from, you know, months and months and months to very little backlog at all. I, I, I find it, I find our processing time, and let me find where, what that page is, in, on page nine, if you look at the, that um, from 2017 to, to 2019, You'll see this, and this is charted in weeks, by the way. Um, so you'll see that it varies from, from place to place to place, but the big point where this changed was um, in the summer of, of, of 19, where um, our staff did a tremendous job in really looking at who was doing what in terms of our analysts and basically just knocked everything out of the park. So we are close to current 
in processing equivalencies. I never thought I would see that. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, like I said, uh, I would pause here for questions um, from the board, but let me just say that um, the licensing division staff has done a super job. Um, our new manager is, is very, very excited and, and is dug right in. And I'm, I'm looking forward to introducing you to, you to her to you in May. So questions on from the licensing report? Any questions from board members? I do have a question, well not really a question, but a, a, an observation. And I'm not sure at which, which report I saw it in. I know I have it written down under licensing, but it's hard to pull these all up on this computer. Um, it looked, so it's more about there was this very, very detailed number of like pages and pages of stuff. But what I wrote down was, it seems like the number of people that are taking the exams has remained consistent. So that would mean that the schools are kind of turning out the same number of graduates. But it seemed like the number of people that are actually taking the exam each year is decreasing. So I was wondering mm -hmm. if there's been any, any look into that or... You know, and that's a, that's a great question. And I know that um, the Education Division and the Education Committee will probably be looking into having a more in-depth discussion of that. Um, and Marie can jump in whenever she wants to. But my sense of this is that um, while the schools continue to be admitting um, similar or even higher numbers of students, um, a variety of things are, are taking place that um, either delay or reduce the number of students going and, and taking the NCLEX. Um, one being that students in some schools um, go through a high stakes exit exam and if, should they not pass that exam, they're not allowed to take the NCLEX until they pass that. Um, I, don't, I don't know how widely used that is, but um, I, I know that we're gonna be looking into that. Um, and, and just, just to give the props, our, our Dr. Fairchild has, has emerged as our, as our NCLEX and testing um, expert, and we were actually just discussing this quite recently. Um, just by way of background, um, Dr. Fairchild actually used to work for a system called ATI, which provides a lot of test prep um, for students um, nationwide. And um, we've been talking a little bit about looking at ways in which we can maybe not so much streamline or improve, but really, I think, increase that knowledge base. Um, so anyways, uh, this, is, this is an area that we're, we're going to see a lot of discussion on. Thank you. That was just an observation that I made. Just, and I know that we, it comes up a lot when we're talking about and for schools too with pass rates. Yes. If the people aren't testing, then so like we're graduating, we're we're educating the same number, we're graduating the same number, we're not testing the same number, so right. therefore we're not turning out the same number of nurses. So there's just right. seems and to be an opportunity area there. I would agree completely. I guess Elaine? it was in the educational division statistical. Can I data. respond a little bit to Donna? You bet. So we at at Sac City College, we have that same issue of students not taking the test, and we're actually doing an informal survey right now um, to find out why they'll graduate and they won't take their test for over six months. And we think some of it is financial need. People are coming into programs like this because they want to better their situation, but then they don't have the financial means to sit for NCLEX, believe it or not. Mm. That's a shame, because you lose knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's been an issue. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's been raised by the uh, program directors. Some of the program directors. A question about the, that fee. The testing organization provides no fee waiver? Right, and I think one no. of the biggest problems is it's not the cost of the BVMPT, it's paying for Pearson View, right. which um, tax on an additional, I don't know what they're up to, $175 at this point? Is it up to 200 now? Yeah. Wow. Because there might be some way to do, I'll call it creative financing, so that that might be a joint package right. with... Mm. 
books, materials. Some schools do that. that so some, and I suggest this to all the directors, um, please inc include that in your tuition because we all know that students are very poor when they graduate. They've been in school for a year, 13, 14 months. Two, okay, so $200 for Pearson View, um, $220 for their license fee. What else? There's one other thing. Application I think application fee. fee. So I, it's seven hundred and almost eight hundred dollars to get their license. So include it in their fees and have the schools pay. Have it already there in a pot ready for the students. I know you guys can't do it, Carol. Right? No, yeah. College can't but private it. schools can, yeah. and I did it for every school I was a director at. And believe you me, if they know that they're going to get reimbursed then they will, I think that might help them. Of course, there's various reasons why students don't test, uh, but that financial is definitely one of them. And for just a little hint for the publics, um, work with your foundation board. Um, Dr. Mountain, or other publics that are in the room, uh, just a suggestion, work with your foundation board. Oh. And I'll be happy at some other time to share how that can work. Any other questions or comments on the licensing report? Thank you. That brings us to the Ledge Reg Committee. Good afternoon. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, Madam Vice President, uh, congratulations on your reelection. Uh, fellow you. board Thank members, uh, executive <laughs> officer, staff, and guests here this afternoon, morning still. Uh, the Ledge Ridge Committee met on Friday, January 24th. Ms. Carpenter and myself uh, were in attendance. We considered uh, first the 2020 sunset legislation. And staff recommended include, including the following concepts in our sunset bill. These included statutory authority for the school fees as the was part of the EO's report uh, this morning, which the board has discussed and we have previously approved in concept, requiring licensees to provide email addresses and the authority to create a site and find program for the schools. Uh, we referred this to staff uh, for further development. No action was taken at the meeting, but we'll retain that item as uh, future for a uh, future agenda. Uh, the second thing we discussed primarily was the proposed legislation regarding care for patients on mechanical ventilators, as was also addressed this morning. And the concept, of course, is to create a post-licensure certification program to ensure uniformity of, of training and uh, competency uh, by VNs and PTs. This was discussed and approved by the board at the February 3rd meeting. Uh, we also discussed regulatory language to implement AB 2138, and of course this law aimed at reducing barriers to licensure and employment goes, effect, goes into effect in July, and it relates to uh, post-conviction rehabilitation criteria, which uh, this board will uh, consider for future applications. Uh, staff has been working closely with council to develop the required regulatory language to submit to the Office of Administrative Law, and that will be handled in due time. And that, of course, uh, was discussed and approved uh, at the February 3rd meeting. We talked about the proposed 2020 rulemaking calendar. Uh, it was included as part of the packet, and a hard copy was distributed yesterday. And this is an annual list of the board's intended rulemaking activities. And many of these concepts are already familiar to the board as we've worked through them in the past and considered them. Applicant licensee fee changes. This language completes the implementation of the fee changes that took effect uh, this past January 1st. Uh, school pass rates is also addressed. This language will enact the changes approved by the board in 2018 and it relates to the setting of the required NCLEX passage rates for schools at 75% of the state average. 
We also uh, included active duty military licensee benefits, and this language reflects legislation enacted in 2017. While we have already adapted its procedures to comply with the law, the language was never added to the board's regulation, so this is really a cleanup for that effort. Uh, the new addition is also regarding applicant and licensee fees. It's a placeholder, placeholder in case the board needs to increase the existing fees. Staff is continuing to work with the DCA budget office to determine when an increase will be needed and at what level. And this will likely be a discussion at the Wednesday, dis uh, Wednesday session uh, when the board meets in May. So it was moved uh, through Ledge Reg Committee and we recommend that this board approves the 2020 rulemaking calendar. So that is our motion. Any questions about the rulemaking calendar? Okay. Uh, John, your motion was to approve? That's correct. Do board members have questions for John? Seeing none. Clay, do you want to add anything? Our regulations council. Madam President, members of the board, my name is Clay Jackson, and you probably all heard me on the phone. And and I work with Ken, as Ken indicated earlier. Uh, I'm an attorney three, as Ken is, and my sole job on uh, at DCA is writing regulations, making sure they get through. And this is something that, believe it or not, I'm excited about. <laughs> and and. Uh, Unlike a lot of attorneys, I actually grew up starting in seventh grade in Model United Nations, wanting to actually get into Model United Nations for many years prior to that. And so I'm that kid, okay? And so I grew up and I like writing re regulations. I, I enjoy doing, uh, as, as some of my friends say, playing in the sandbox down at the legislature. And so I look forward to being able to work with you and, and your staff and make sure that your regulations get through more quickly and, and efficiently. And, and the, on AB 2138, for example, your packet is one of 10 that I'm working on. And out of 38 boards, that's, you know, it's a good chunk. So I, I enjoy it and I look forward to working with you. And, do you have any questions of me? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. So the motion on the floor is to approve the 2020 rulemaking calendar. It came out of the committee, so it, requ it requires no second. Um, is there any further discussion by board? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Myself is yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. And Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you, Madam President. Our next item involves, uh, as part of our strategic plan, the concept of creating a BVNPT day at the Capitol where we could interact with uh, lawmakers and staff. And as part of that concept, we are looking at a target date of spring 2021 for the launch of the event. That would involve uh, BVNPT staff and uh, uh, board members. So we would move that we work towards a target date of spring 2021 for the launch of that event. <coughs> that also came from the committee. Okay. Bless you. Bless you. Is this an action item? Do we need a motion? Yeah. Yes, it is an action item. I was <laughs> typing. Sorry. So moved. <laughs> so, 
It came out of committee. Oh, okay. The motion the was to. Excuse the motion. Excuse distraction. It was to move towards a, looking at a launch date of spring 2021, working for the um, BVMPT day at the Capitol. Um, it came out of the committee, so it re requires no second. Do board members have any questions of John? Yes. Uh, so two questions. One is, um, can you give me a better idea of what it would, what the day is for? Um, and two, why 2021? That's a full year away. It'll take some planning. Uh, our so current what will calendar. take some planning? I guess that's the well, piece. What will just, take planning? Just for the day. It's an, an idea of raise to raise our visibility, so uh, you know, a staff and legislators know who we are the valuable work that we do. And, uh, you know, we may consider inviting other, uh, you know, special interest groups, uh, CNA and others. We'll ask, we'll ask staff to flesh out the, the details, but the idea is to raise our visibility so we are continue to be known uh, at the state capitol. So would you be attempting to get on the legislators' uh, um, meeting for that day, going around visiting different, different legislators with a, yes, all with of a the above. group of people from the BVNT that would then give a presentation about this is who we are, this is what we do. Um, would you also be um, setting up an informational booth outside to let visitors know? Um, um, because coming from a union background, we do a lot of lobbying. It almost sounds like you're going to lobby that, exactly. the legislature. So, um, it's in that aspect that you're thinking of this BVNPT day. Yes. Okay. Do you have anything else? Uh? Oh, I'd love to. Um, I, I think just by way of background, um, and we discussed this uh, in the context of the strategic plan uh, throughout last year, um, it is a cold fact that decision makers, I think actually members of the general public, don't understand nursing as a whole, and they certainly don't understand the distinction between the RNs, the advanced practice nurses and vocational nurses, and they certainly don't understand what our psych techs do. Um, we think that in as much as legislators and, and members of the government make decisions um, about our professions and about our board, it's really incumbent upon us to make sure that their decisions are as educated as they possibly can be. Um, so there's a number of things, and, and obviously we can't really develop a, a fast agenda just yet, but you know, we, we can see a number of possibilities, one being um, it, with the cooperation partnership and participation of all the programs, you know, the 140-odd um, VN and, and PT programs throughout the state, um, we pretty much do cover um, most of the legislative districts in California. Um, having them go visit their own representatives to say there are, you know, this many, I come from this school in your district, this is what we do, this is what LVNs do, this is what psych techs do. Um, I think that would be tremendously valuable um, in enhancing our profile and enhancing the understanding of the work we do. I, I think we've been underrepresented and unsung for so many years that, it, again, it, it's a very, very important move forward for for this board. Um, so uh, it, it's hard for me to, to actually say that here's the agenda of what we would do, but I, I think that having an informational booth outside um, would be terrific. I think having meetings with the members is really critical, um, and producing some information, general information, um, to share with folks would be absolutely essential for us to do. Um, the reason we, we can't really just do this right away, it takes time to, to, I mean, just preserve a place at the Capitol to schedule meetings. And we have to have something uh, substantive to discuss. And providing this kind of um, movement, this kind of uh, event, does take a significant amount of, of planning and execution. Um, just as a, as a footnote, I coordinated events like this for the UC students for about five years, um, way, way back in the 90s. Um, and it, it takes a good deal of orchestration and it takes a good deal to do it correctly. 
um, so that you have a unified, um, coherent, simple message and, and good materials to hand out so that, again, the, the, the general message here is we're not a really, we're not a household word by any means, but the understanding level of, of, of our, our licensees and, and the work they do is woefully small. Um, we, we need to fix that in order to go forward. Um, we should have done this years and years ago, truthfully. Um, but it, it's an exciting thing, and I know that the program directors who were at the forum yesterday kind of perked up a little bit when we talked about it. Um, I think there's a good amount of, of excitement and, and willingness to participate. Um, by next year, it's not certain what there would be in terms of any specific legislation to actually lobby. And depending on the time of year, um, it's not clear what actual hearings or floor sessions or anything would be available to, to participate in or at least witness. But, um, but as I said, this is a, a starting place, really. And I think as we move forward, and, 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 and truthfully, part of the reason why we can't really spring this really soon is we have a lot on the plate, and I don't have a ledge analyst right now. So, um, but we're moving forward, and, and, and as I said, I think between the, the ledge and regs committee and the executive excuse me, committee, we're going to be pulling together, I think, some better ideas, some more finite date choices, and some other parameters for, for an event. But, uh, but like I said, I, I think there's a lot of excitement about this. I'm Thank not you. sure what the, what the plan is, but I would suggest that it It'd be planned as an annual event. If you're going to put this much effort up front into creating this, it should be something that is continuing. I would agree. Annual or at least biannual every yeah. legislative session. Okay. Any further discussion needed by board? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none. So the motion came out of committee. It re requires no second. It says... Um, to look towards a launch date of spring 2021 for a BVMPT day at the Capitol. Uh, Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes. Um, a yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Yes. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Thank you. And then finally, we'll meet uh, Madam President uh, March 20th. 2 to 4 p.m. That concludes our report. Thank you. And that will bring us to Enforcement Division report recommendations and possible actions. Jay? Screening manager has accepted a position with the Bureau of Cannabis Control. I want to say that I very much enjoyed working with Matt and getting to know him over the years. So I just wanted to take this opportunity publicly on behalf of the entire enforcement division and wish him well in the future and thank him for his many contributions to the boards over the years. So thank you for that. And if any of, any of you have questions, I can take them now. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. And the committee report, Ken. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the enforcement committee had our uh, our first meeting in a while um, recently, um, and we did it by phone. Um, and it was the conversation was really an analysis of you know what the voting has has been and how it's been the process has been going. And so um, I don't know if each of the board members has received the analysis that we have. Did each one of them receive this? So I just want to read through that so we can kind of discuss that, um, if necessary. Um, our, view of the, our review of the closed session voting process for the last three years indicates several clear trends. The majority of the cases that go to closed session are adopted, reached closed session by the minimum two-vote requirement, and those two votes are generally cast to non-adopt the case. It is rare for a board member to indicate that they would like to hold the case for a closed session discussion. Only eight of the 68 cases in the last three years had, had votes that indicated discussions was warranted. 
The current board <coughs> voting process requires a two vote minimum to send a case to closed session. They may be two votes for non-adoption, two votes to hold for a closed session, or one vote from either category. A review of the voting process of a sample of a other DCA Healing Arts boards indicates ours differs from the majority in the way we tally votes for closed session. Most other Healing Arts boards only consider hold for closed session votes in deciding whether a case is discussed in closed session. Votes to adopt are simply tallied in comparison to adopt votes in seeking a majority. Therefore, I believe an analysis of this information gathered indicates that the board could make changes to the process that would allow it to function more efficiently. Um, as such, I'm recommending two things. And first um, recommendation is I recommend that the board change the voting process so that the only cases that receive the two or more hold for closed session votes are actually discussed in closed session. Any votes to adopt or are counted against adopt votes to establish a majority. Any discussion around that? Or any yes. Other? Go ahead. So I have a couple of, um, so one of the reasons, so we've, as being on the board for a long time, um, I have a lot of history here, so Tammy, you can okay. chime in as well. Uh, one of the reasons that, well, I personally will say that I stopped marking um, closed session because closed session non-adopt was essentially the same thing. So it had the same outcome so it didn't matter which, which box that you adopted. So um, when I first came on the board if I felt like I needed to have the ability to discuss with fellow board members a case then I would mark it for closed session. Uh, and then I found out that non-adopt is the same thing. So um, I think what you're proposing is that we, do, we no longer count the non-adopt as needing to go to closed session. So in your scenario, it could be that if one person votes to, for closed session, but the majority of the people vote to adopt, but there are a couple of people that vote to non-adopt, that case would not go to closed session. I yes. think that's what it is, yeah. That's correct. Um, okay, so then the other thing that I, I mean, and I read this report, and, and it goes on to say that because of the, the size of our board, that I think puts, you haven't gotten there yet, but I'll just circumvent it. I think you're also recommending that the number of votes that it takes be increased as well to three. Because of the size of the board? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Correct? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So at face value, I, when I first looked at that, I thought, <clears throat> well, we do have 11 board members. But as I looked at board member vote logs, um, there are three board members that historically do not cast votes. So then you would have to decrease from 11 to 8, a board of 8, because those are the people that are consistently casting votes in the mail ballots. So then it's not as, you'd have to compare to a board member of eight. You can't really say 11 if three of them aren't casting votes. And it's not that they're not occasionally casting votes. It's consistently they're not casting votes. So I guess I wouldn't be in support of changing that. And having, being a board member on the board for as long as I have been, going to close session, um, and having to extend our disciplinary hearing day is not something that I look forward to, but I do believe that it is necessary because while the statistics may show that the outcome doesn't change, you have at least had the ability to validate your own thoughts. And also during those sessions, we learn a lot. Um, so for those reasons, I am not in support of changing the way that cases go to closed session or changing the number of votes required unless we can ascertain that if we have 11 board members and we want it to be an increased percentage then all board members are going to have to start casting votes in the mail ballots 
Uh, and, I'm sorry. Any other yeah. discussion? I mean, yeah, I, I have uh, just an observation. As board members, when we receive the ballots, we're doing so in isolation. And some of these cases uh, really hinge on some kind of technical definition or interpretation of the facts. And some of us uh, public members, we don't have uh, you know, really the ability to weigh in as uh, a licensee would. So the only opportunity really for a full robust discussion uh, with the entire board is in closed session. Otherwise, we continue to uh, vote in, in isolation, exercising you know, whatever judgment we have at the time based on the facts of the case. I would like to add that in those rare, because we had a couple of them last evening where they were going to go one way and during closed session, they went a different way. Um, so, and, and that's valuable, whether it's a positive or a negative, but that ability to have discussion is valuable. Yeah, the, the numbers you're showing here, it's you know, somewhere between 20 and 25% are changing in that closed session. So that's not an insignificant number of, of cases where discussion has changed the ultimate outcome. I, I don't want to break that. So I, I had an, um, I'll refrain. I had a, an, well, I'll just put it out there. So in the interest of not having to spend more money and all of that, but it does seem now that we're doing more committee work that this day is much shorter than it used to be. We could move the closed session cases to this day um, and extend and have more petition hearings on the other day. I mean, I don't know, but if we're mm -hmm. looking to, I'm looking to get the cases solved and looking to get the backlog solved and looking to be really efficient with our time without having to give up the ability to have discussion with other board members. And I know, Jay, this is, that is near and dear to your heart because you have to sit in there with us. Um, <coughs> but I think the discussion is valuable. Just reflecting on what has been said, um, I do agree. The discussion has been extremely helpful. Um, we all see the cases from different perspectives based upon the experiences we bring to the table. The use of possibly Friday afternoons for closed sessions is a good idea depending upon our agenda because we have had some Friday afternoons that have been quite lengthy. Um, it, it depends upon the case load. And so when the load would be heavy, what might be all, our alternative? Just thinking of logistics. I just threw that out there as an alternative to changing the way we vote and the ability to not have and again, I'm not, I'm not saying that because we do have an 11 member board, I think we do have to look at quorum. I do think that there should, there should be stakeholders like when we're doing closed session, like there should be, there should be a licensee involved in the closed session. So we want to make sure that we have licensees, mm -hmm. um, okay. along with the public members. Um, and if we want to say that we're going to increase to three, then the full board needs to start voting on the ballot on the ballots. But I would invite other board members to weigh in. That's just one person's opinion. No, I agree. I think that the discussion that we have regarding some of the cases in closed session that are difficult is incredibly important. And that proved itself yesterday. Indeed. Okay. Any other 
thoughts? I mean, given where we are, it, it, it seems this might be something that might go back to the committee with some suggestion on how we might pilot the changes. Um, <coughs> the other piece that's really critical here is having everyone participate in the review and voting, which really helps to make the difference. Suggesting a motion to refer. Or Is there a motion? Well, there's a motion right now that's on the floor. Oh, okay. About changing the way that the ballots go into closed session, which is to move only the ones that are marked for closed session to closed session. Yep. Nothing about the amount of votes going is not in there and, yet. And Madam Chair, this was not taken up as an action item, so it would require a motion and a second, since it's not coming out of committee with a recommendation. So it, for this particular one, it would require a motion and a second. So there is no motion. Oh, no well, second, yeah. yeah. There's no second yet. Make a motion. I, I would like to make a motion that we at least consider the first recommendation uh, that the board change the voting process so that the only cases that receive two or more hold for closed session votes are actually discussed in closed session. I'm sorry, I only heard part of that. But okay. I'll re I'll, I'll re say the recommendation. I recommend that the board change the voting process so that only cases that receive two or more hold for closed session votes are actually discussed in closed session. So how does that, how does that differ from current practice? So if, if I may, I mean, I, I could be in support of that, but it would just change the way I vote. Instead right. of voting non-adopt, I would just vote more for closed session. So I don't think that it gets to, the, to what you're really trying to get at, or maybe it does, but I, I certainly could be in support of that, um, knowing that I will just change the way I cast my vote. So I'll second Ken's motion. Um, for me, it's not adopt and closed session is the same, but I can see where maybe I just don't agree with the ALJ's decision, and I might I may be the minority, but I don't need to. I don't feel I need to discuss it. Right. So I would mark non adopt versus. And if I felt that I needed to discuss it, I would probably mark closed session. Mm -hmm. It would still get mm -hmm. to the same purview, I guess, is what I want to say. Are we, are we limited to one selection? Can, can, can you we, are limited to one selection. Limited to one. Okay. Yes. So I, again, historically in the past, we had this discussion about four years ago, maybe, maybe five. Um, and that's when we just started changing. Like we, we all knew and most of the we that I'm talking about aren't here anymore. Um, we all knew that it didn't matter if we adopt or close session, that it was going to go to closed session either way. So uh, to your point, Tammy, yes, there are some times I will just vote non-adopt, and if I vote non-adopt and everybody else thinks it's an adopt and I don't need to have discussion, then that's one thing. So this could actually be a <coughs> more expedient way of doing things. Um, it appears the argument here is that you're trying to get the ones that are voted to adopt or not adopt implemented Correct. more efficiently. Correct. If you don't feel there's a need for a closed session discussion, you want to just vote adopt or not adopt, then yes, those could be handled more expeditiously. That's correct. So we should just vote for... Um, 
closed session when we want to have a discussion. As you mentioned, there may be times when you don't agree with a decision or a settlement, but you don't necessarily feel you need to talk about mm -hmm. it. And at that point, it could be an adopt versus tallied non-adopt votes. And then the, if there's a quorum, then it's obviously the majority. And we don't need to discuss it in closed session. So that's what we're trying to do. We know about those cases, the ones that you really feel you need to talk about, and then the ones that you don't want to discuss, but maybe you just don't agree or do agree with either the decision or the stipulated settlement. So then the ultimate change that we're making is that we're no longer going to send the non adopt the two non adopts to closed session. We that would be to correct. Specifically yeah. Ask for yeah, you'd have to specifically ask for closed session. That's correct. I can support that. Put it in, putting it in that light. And so you're proposing now you need two or more people to request a closed session? Right now the way votes are tallied, if there's uh, two, two non-adopts or two closed session votes, the case goes to closed session. If there's one non-adopt, one hold for closed session, the case goes to closed session. So this is just <laughs> separating the process out. So if it's two or more hold for closed session votes, it goes to closed session. We're not combining the votes any longer. Well, just as a matter of practice, couldn't we just change our vote anyway to move to closed session you without any formal board action? Mm. Because, because in point of fact, uh, Madam President, when I vote, I, I typically <coughs> a comment as to why I okay? either, yeah. well, usually vote to non-adopt. That's correct, you do. Yeah. Oh. Not oh. everyone does, but you always do. I always do. How, how would the one, so if one person voted for a closed session and the rest, it carried one way or the other, would that be considered a If one abstation? voted for closed session and no one else did, then whatever the majority of the votes that tallied would be, it'd be either adopt or non-adopt. And, and that person would be counted as abstaining? They'd be counted as a hold for closed session. So it would, okay, so it would be tallied. Well, then what threshold would we need then for closed session? Two? Two. two. Currently, two. it would be two, correct. The motion on the table is just for the hold for closed session vote. It's not combined with the motion or recommendation to raise the minimum to three votes. So uh, assuming we had one vote to non-adopt and one closed session, it would still be adopted if that was with a majority with a quorum, correct. Right, so that does differ from the, the current practice. Yes. And really, it forces individuals who would like a discussion to not vote to non-adopt, but rather to, to request, request a closed session. Correct. Okay. That's a little confusing. So the, I guess for, to make it easier, so the, the actual, what we're trying, it's really not about the number. It's really about the changing the process. Yeah. That what we're changing is that you currently must have two votes for closed session. And have, have you calculated, or do you know the, the average time from when it's sent to us and Oof. that they wait for this board to meet? Closed session, you know what I'm saying? You well, that depends on just the calendar, you know, the time of the year. Votes go out roughly every 10 days. You have 10 days to get them back. And then it just depends on where we are in the year. We always have board meetings in February. I, guess I understand that. I guess I'm trying to understand what the average savings of efficiency we would get. We haven't calculated that at this point. We don't know point. that average. Well, it would make sense that it would be at least 60 days because we're only meeting quarterly. We have had a couple of instances where we had to actually call a board meeting and go into closed session because the calendar right. was going to run out. Yeah. That's correct. The 100 days were going to be up. Yeah. Yes. Any further questions or discussions? Seeing none, the motion is to change the voting process to two or more Hold for closed session versus the current, um, no, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Don't need to add confusion. So any public comment? Seeing none, Donna? Clearly.
Ideally, I need to have more discussion. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Closed for, discussion. Can we hold this for close? Closed Close session. Uh, because it really is, it's, not, it's really not about that. It's really about now you can have somebody that's, you can have one non-adopt right. and, and one, one closed, closed session. session. That changes. And then we come back and we, and it goes to closed session and we talk about it. Okay. That, that opportunity now is, so you could essentially have two board members that are like, hey, I really wanted to discuss this. It's really about, as board members, we would have to change. You would, but then also there would be an opportunity, there would be where you wouldn't have the opportunity any longer to do that. Right. But I guess if you back that up to the number, like 25% of the time it changes, um, I guess we'd just have to be more stringent upon the cases we actually wanted to discuss and marking them that way. Um, Yes. Paul? Yes. John? No. Bernice? Abstain. Emma, yes. Ken? Yes. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Still don't understand, it, so I have to abstain. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Abstain. Madam President, could you review the vote? Pardon? Could you review the vote? So Donna was yes. I Paul? Okay. So just the Oh, girl. just the count. The old girl. <laughs> Two, three, six, yes. One no, three abstain. So essentially it's six to four. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So motion carried to hold for closed session. We need to mark closed session. Two or more votes. Okay. Well, we could do that now. Though. So I don't want to see. I'm going to have to vote. Is there more from enforcement? Yeah, just one other point. Uh, just want to uh, reclaim what um, Donna said earlier um, in regards to the recommendation number two that I had around the board Ken. consisting of 11 members. And Madam oh, Chair, can you? we have order, please. Yeah, in, in regards to the second recommendation, I think I'll hold off on that until next time um, based on um, the conversation we just had, um, and uh, we'll report back to the board at a later time. At a later time. Thank you. Thank you. Does that complete your it, report? It completes the report, and I just want to thank my colleagues for uh, the conversation. Question to the committee. Um, the proposal and then the potential future proposal. The thinking is better efficiency, um, working better with staff. Um, I, I think it might help some of the members if they have a sense of why such recommendations in general? I would ask Mr. Prouty to come back up and say a couple words. The question again, I'm sorry? If you can just provide a general overview for why of these recommendations. I think it will help some of the board members. Just again, it's an overview of we did a review of other boards voting practices and look back at our own closed session practices. Um, just we do spend a lot of time in closed session, as you guys all know, and just was really a, um, trying to take a look at the numbers and see if there is a way we could be more efficient or handle cases in a more expeditious manner. Um, and again, as I said, also, we found that we were somewhat out of sync with the way other boards were voting in DCA and just, again, trying to become a little more uniform. Thank you. You're welcome. So could you stay? <laughs> um, just because we kind of talked about this a little bit yesterday. Um, 
a lot of times we're getting these cases, these mail ballots, and we're not allowed to have any discussion with each other while we're reading them. That's correct. Uh, we also, especially in You are the, allowed to call Ken or I if you have questions. Yeah, but I don't think you really want me calling you at 11 o'clock at night, which is when I'm reading them. Well, I wouldn't answer the phone at that time, but I'd call you back during regular business hours. I know, but during business hours, I'm at my other job. And so that's part of the problem. And there's really not a good opportunity to reach out and get any history about, like, because I may have questions about or things that don't make sense. We did a case last night that the whole thing made no sense at all from a licensee's perspective. Um, so... In, in order to, and, and I appreciate 100% what you're trying to do. I, I do. Thank you. Um, and I appreciate the fact that we're trying to get licensees that shouldn't be practicing quicker to, to not be practicing. However, um, more so in the stipulated decisions where we don't have the benefit of the licensee having been in front of a judge, we have this back and forth, but we don't, we have an accusation that we can read, but frequently it's just an accusation. There's no truth to it at that point. I mean, it's just it's been reported. Um, and in the stipulated decisions, we have, there's not a lot to go on. So as far as question-wise, and really, I don't even know what I'm asking now. Um, but perhaps in the stips, if you could... If there was more given to us in the stipulations as far as the why behind what was happening? I think you're referring benefit. to the recommendation letters that come from the AG's office. Um, and I am working with my staff and with the AG's office on trying to put more detail into those because I agree there is times they're lacking in the information you need to make a decision. So that is an ongoing process that we're undertaking right now. Okay. That, would, that would help a lot because a lot of times I simply have to vote for closed session or to non-adopt that simply because I have too many questions and not an opportunity to actually to reach out. I can completely understand that. That's all. Any other questions? Any other questions from board members? Thank you. Thank you, Jay. So that concludes, so. Yeah, that concludes the enforcement committee. OK, thank you. thank you, Ken. So that brings us to the Board calendar 2020 through 2021. I thought it was through 2022. It is. It goes through 22. Um, that's page two. Um, all right, so we sent this um, proposed calendar out as part of the packet. Um, we took the liberty of adding to this current year some of the other events that impact the overall schedule for BVNPT, mostly um, the National Council's dates. Um, this gives you, I think, a bigger picture of uh, what um, what happens throughout the year. Um, but but basically, so things that are bookending our own board, mem board meetings. But um, we need, of course, the, the calendar to be approved through 2022, but we also needed to um, amend the, the posted calendar for 2021, um, as the president pointed out, we had scheduled our board meeting for about the same week as the NCSBN annual meeting. Um, so to enable the the president and the executive officer to see both of those events, we are recommending a change in that calendar so that we would we would move the board's meeting. And I was sure I'd put a date on that. But the, the, so it either, of course, the week prior or the week following uh, the, the NCSBN meeting. So that would be. Thank you. Yes, 12 13. So, for August 2021, 
We would like to amend the um, board meeting calendar to the 12th and 13th versus the 19th and 20th. And that's for 2021, not this year. Do board members have any questions or comments? What was, the, oh, sorry. So August 12th and 13th? Yes. For 2021. Not quite sure I'll be, what I'll be doing on that day, but now I am. <laughs> <laughs> so, any other questions or comments? Is there a motion? Move to accept the 2021 calendar. Second. Actually, it goes through 22. 2021 22. Second again. <laughs> Any other comment needed by board members? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Donna? Yes. Paul? Yes. John? Yes. Bernice? Yes, as amended. Myself is yes, as amended. Ken? Yes, as amended. Alita? Yes. Cheryl? Stain. I didn't hear it. Carol? Yes. Melissa? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. So, um, Elaine, you'll make that correction on the board's site? Yes, please. And that leads us to agenda item 20, public comment. Um, individuals may appear before the board at this time to, dis to discuss items not on the agenda. The board may not discuss or take any action on any items raised during this public comment section except to decide whether to place it on the agenda of a future meeting. Any comments from the public? Seeing none, that brings us to Agenda uh, item 21, suggestions for future agenda items. Madam President, um, my um, hope for a future agenda item would be around some testimonials or some success stories of some of our wonderful psych technicians or vocational nurses um, to come to the meeting and uh, you know, just share with us what their journey has been like and so we can actually celebrate them with the rest of the state um, because I think it's a big part of our um, efforts that we do here. Okay. We were going to hear back on the collection of the cost recovery. Okay. Any others? Well, I guess I do have, if we could get over it. Um, I just don't want to lose sight of the fact that what we're thinking outside the box, trying to interact more with the school directors about outreach to <coughs> prevention of, of enforcement. <laughs> so. Okay. Any others? Seeing none, any public comment? Seeing none, that brings us to agenda item 22. We will adjourn the meeting at 1215. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you.